Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible class at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight and we are in the book of Exodus. So I want to invite you to be turning with me to Exodus chapter 9. We'll be there in just a few moments. Last week we actually got together in person so that we could bring tons of clothing from the basement to the upstairs to the auditorium at our church facility as we prepared for the annual clothing giveaway. We do this on the second Saturday in August every year. So thank you so much to those of you who showed up in person last week. And also thanks to those of you who came in on Saturday morning as well. We did have the giveaway this past Saturday morning from 9 until 1 in the afternoon actually. And around 80 people were able to help themselves to a whole lot of free clothing. We had some very good discussions concerning the Lord and his church. And a lot of good was done here in Madison this past uh, Saturday morning. By the way, some of you commented on the sound last week, that it was hard to hear at times. And I guess I should maybe let you know if you want to uh, know a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, some of the challenges of uh, live streaming a discussion type class. Uh, one of those challenges is picking up the sound as people are making comments. And if you remember how we used to do Bible class on a Wednesday evening, um, often the scripture readings would be done by people sitting in the pews and of course the microphone at the front didn't catch that too well so we would have an entire Bible class with nothing but the, with the, no Bible in it uh, because that wasn't picked up by the front microphone so we had to play around with that a little bit and to make a long story short we basically switch between two microphones now uh, when the teacher is speaking we use the unidirectional mic on the podium which is perfectly clear since it picks up everything in a kind of a basketball size area directly in front of the microphone but when comments are being made in class um, those are obviously not picked up too well by the microphone up front they're not in that basketball size uh, kind of bubble and so uh, we switch to an omnidirectional kind of every direction type mic that's hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the auditorium and the challenge is that ceiling mic picks up everything rustling pages coughing breathing heartbeats of everybody in class it seems like sometimes and uh, any little sneeze or somebody dropping something it's all picked up on that one and so the the challenge is with it picking up everything we got to switch back and forth from the ceiling mic to the mic up front and it is a lot of work for whoever's running a live stream in the back going uh, back and forth like that and unfortunately the teacher is pretty much the farthest voice from that microphone uh, when it's being used so it requires that switching back and forth it's a challenge and uh, I did go back and listen to the archive live stream of last week's class it wasn't bad on my device so if you missed it uh, got discouraged by the sound give it another another shot uh, at least on my phone at home, uh, it came in pretty well. And for those of you who called back later and caught class Thursday or Friday, um, we had another issue. Some of you might have called and heard nothing but music when you called in. I got at least one call about that. Um, sometimes when we go live, um, we go live on the phone stream a few minutes early. And uh, so you don't think the line is dead when you call in. We play music to fill the gap, as I understand it. And it's kind of like being on hold. We're letting you know that we're here, uh, but that we haven't started yet. Well, if you called in after the fact, some of you heard the music when you called in on Thursday or Friday or Saturday. And you thought you were doing something wrong. And so you tried again, and sure enough, you called back, and there was more music. And uh, after 30 seconds or a minute, you kind of said, well, that's enough of that, and kind of hung up and gave up on listening to class. So... Um, I just want to let you know that the class came on after that music for a few minutes. So uh, letting you know it's out there if you want to go back on the phone. If you listen long enough, <laughs> class will eventually start. But I uh, thought I should try to explain since I know some of you were confused by the music on the phone stream this week. Um, anyway, we are back to the book of Exodus. And we are in the middle of the ten plagues right now. So God has told Moses to go to Pharaoh to demand that Pharaoh let the Israelites go, releasing them from slavery. Pharaoh is stubbornly refusing to obey the Lord's command. And so God responds with a series of plagues. And these plagues are aimed at humiliating the various gods of Egypt. So far, we've had the water turning to blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, and then also the plague of flies. Um, with the plague of blood, the uh, water turning to blood, plague number one, Pharaoh's magicians, you may remember, repeated the miracle and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. 
Okay, with the frogs, plague number two, Pharaoh's magicians also managed to create at least a few frogs, maybe like uh, kind of producing a rabbit out of a hat or something like that. But in response, Pharaoh asked Moses and Aaron to ask God to take the frogs away. And you may remember Moses asked him, um, what time would you like me to take the frogs away? <laughs> and uh, Pharaoh decides to spend one more night with the frogs. Very stubborn man, not willing to admit that he's wrong. And uh, so he, he hardens his heart one more time. Well, with the gnats, which is plague number three, the magicians do the best they can to replicate this one, but uh, they fail. And uh, this is beyond us. They realize this one is truly the finger of God. Uh, this is the real deal. Moses is speaking on behalf of the one true and living God. And uh, so Pharaoh's heart is hardened once again, even though he hears that. Well, with plague number four, which is the flies, God sends uh, flies only on the Egyptians. So there is a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And, um, and that's pretty impressive. I mean, Pharaoh is kind of uh, interested, I think, in this one. And as a result, he budges just a little. And he wants Moses to compromise. We'll just meet in the middle. Instead of leaving, uh, just sacrifice here. Just go a short distance. Go, don't go off two or three days in the wilderness like you want to. Well, uh, thankfully, Moses doesn't fall for it. And this time, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And he refuses once again to let the people go. So that brings us up to where we are tonight. So we're going to jump back into it tonight with uh, picking up with uh, plague number five. And this is Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. The Lord set a definite time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. If you remember last week's study, we noted that the plagues are pretty much, they are, they are naturally occurring events. But they're naturally occurring events that God has caused to afflict the people in a supernatural way. Uh, proving without a doubt that these are above and beyond nature. This is not something that we would see normally. You know, we know what blood and water are. We always have frogs. We always have uh, flies and gnats. Uh, but God uses these things from the natural world in a supernatural way to demonstrate his power over Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods. Well, so also with plague number five, this pattern continues. So God will cause a pestilence, a plague, a disease of some kind to afflict the Egyptian farm animals. So their horses, their donkeys, their camels, uh, their, their herds and their flocks. But what makes this one especially amazing is that like the flies, the pestilence on the herds will only affect, affect the uh, Egyptians' animals and it will completely avoid damaging the Israelites' animals at all. And this isn't how plagues work, we understand this. So they would have dead animals on one side of the fence and perfectly healthy animals on the other side of the fence. And he goes so far as to say that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. And in my mind, if you're raising flocks and herds, something always goes wrong. Something's always dying. I mean, if you're on a farm, death is a regular occurrence. It's just part of life on a farm. But as I see this, death on the farm is paused during this plague for the Israelites. And God does this to make a clear distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. This would be impressive. And this would be very obvious if, if all that guy's cows die and all the uh, Israelites' cows do not. And once again, God sets a time. So often the timing was a part of proving that it was supernatural. So animals die all the time, but they don't all die at the same time for no apparent reason. And so the timing is a part of the miracle. The death of the farm animals is, uh, is something that happens often. Um, but also it's unique due to the geographical uh, distinction, the limitation of it, and then the timing of it. So this will happen at a set time, not gradually, but suddenly. 
uh, all at once at a particular moment. And the next morning when it happens, notice in verse 7 how Pharaoh sends somebody to go check on the Israelites' livestock. And so when he sees a bunch of his own farm animals dropping dead all around him, he basically sends a deputy. Hey, I need you to go peek over in Goshen and uh, kind of see how things are going over there and uh, come back and tell me whether their cattle are, are all dying like ours are. Well, that messenger comes back and lets him know um, that there is not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. They're happy. They're jumping all around. Their cows are awesome. Uh, but at the end, uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened once again despite this. All right, let's continue then tonight with Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12, the next paragraph. Exodus chapter 8, or Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it toward the sky, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Well, we're now at plague number six. If you're keeping track, if you're writing these down in the margin of your Bible, and this one is unique in that God has Moses and Aaron take soot, soot, or uh, kind of, I would say, fine ashes. Fine ashes is easier to say for me. So take these fine ashes, this dust from a kiln, and they are to throw these handfuls of soot into the air in Pharaoh's presence. And uh, this dust will miraculously spread throughout the land of Egypt, and it'll break out in sores uh, on the people and on the remaining animals throughout the land. And uh, not only do the magicians not even attempt to replicate this, uh, <laughs> because why would they? Uh, who wants more sores? Uh, Pharaoh, watch this. We can double your sores. Uh, no, they don't do that. But in fact, the magicians, uh, they get out of there. <laughs> we have had enough of this situation. We uh, want nothing whatsoever to do with this. And these guys make a run for it. These are probably some pretty, uh, pretty well-educated, smart men with some uh, common sense. And uh, we have had enough of this, so we don't want anything to do with uh, what's, whatever's coming next. Um, the other thing that makes this plague unique is the fact that this is the first one where the text tells us that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I just think it's interesting that we don't get to this, the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart, until we're now more than halfway through the ten plagues. Up to this point, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, or Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Uh, but here, only now do we find that God is described as being the one to harden Pharaoh's heart. So again, this emphasizes uh, that God is not preventing Pharaoh's obedience. God, as we said a few weeks ago, is not sticking his finger into Pharaoh's brain and, and keeping him from obeying. He's not overriding his personal autonomy. Nothing like that. But instead, Pharaoh is stubbornly refusing to obey. He's refused to obey God from the very beginning, and this is continuing, and God is now just uh, pushing him along at this point. So let's continue with the next paragraph, Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. Exodus 9, 13 through 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain, in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. To me, this almost seems like a pause, a little bit of an intermission. And I say that because he doesn't directly threaten the next plague immediately here at this point. But he almost seems to give Pharaoh yet one more chance to think things through. So he almost slows it down just a little bit before just coming out with plague number seven. He slows it down. This is where we are. This is where we're headed. 
And so Moses then is to bring this message to Pharaoh. And if I could paraphrase, the message is, there's more where that came from. We've done this and this and this and this and this and this. And now I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people. And notice here in verse 14, we come back to the real purpose behind these miraculous signs. As I understand it, as I alluded to it a week or two ago, um, God is doing all this so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. So God is using this to teach and to show that he is different from all the other so-called gods of the Egyptians. He is not like them. In verse 15, if I could summarize, God is saying, um, I could have killed every single one of you people by now. But in verse 16, I have graciously allowed you to live. Number one, to show you my power. And then number two, to proclaim my name through all the earth. And so this is for the Egyptians' benefit. Uh, but God also expects word to get out, which it will, if he leaves survivors, which he will. And yet, despite everything that God has done, Pharaoh continues to exalt himself. And I don't think God has put it in quite those terms yet. Uh, Pharaoh is actually being arrogant here. He's a very uh, arrogant man. He's refusing to submit uh, even to an infinitely greater power. And so the plagues will apparently continue. So let's continue then ourselves then on with uh, Exodus chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. Exodus chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hail, such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send... Bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes down on them will die. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. So now we have uh, the next plague. We move on to hail. And like the other plagues, hail is a naturally occurring phenomenon, isn't it? Most of us, I think, have probably been through a few hailstorms in our lives. Uh, but this will be such a uh, very heavy hail, the kind that hadn't yet been seen in Egypt from the day the nation was founded until now. Now, if we think about this in terms of our own experience in our own nation, um, we've had some pretty large hail here in the United States, haven't we? Uh, earlier today, I did a quick Google search and found that the largest hailstone ever recorded in the United States uh, fell on Vivian, South Dakota on July 23, 2010. So that's not very long ago. The hailstone was nearly the size of a bowling ball, 8 inches in diameter, 18.62 inches in circumference. It weighed in at just over 1.9 pounds. Um, I read a report saying that the hailstone was originally 11 inches in diameter, uh, but the guy put it in his freezer, and then the freezer lost power <laughs> because of the hailstorm. And so this uh, world's biggest hailstone, or uh, United States' biggest hailstone, uh, kind of shrunk and uh, got down uh, to about 8 inches across. Um, but that's huge, and um, I'm pretty sure we haven't seen every hailstone to ever fall here in the, in the United States either. That's just the one that we happen to uh, preserve. So I'm just saying that when God threatens uh, hail larger than anybody's ever seen since the nation has been founded, that is a significant threat. A large hail uh, can do a serious amount of damage. But I also want us to notice how God extends grace to the Egyptian people. He warns them about this, and he tells them what to do to avoid it, how to prepare for it. Bring everything inside, because everything that's left outside during this next plague will be uh, killed. Um, can we even imagine being pounded by eight-inch hailstones falling from the sky? Uh, there is no surviving that. Uh, by the way, when I was doing uh, my hail research earlier today, I was kind of surprised that in modern United States history, uh, we have a record of only three total people, three people, grand total, being uh, killed by hail. I, I don't know what I was expecting. I, I thought it would be more than three. Um, first of all, a farmer was caught in his field out near Lubbock, Texas, back on May 13, 1930. He was killed by hail. 
Uh, a baby was struck by large hail in Fort Collins, Colorado on July 31st, 1979. And the baby died from being hit by hail. And then the third one was a boater on Lake Worth, Texas on March 29th, 2000. So pretty recent past. Uh, maybe some of you have had your cars or your roofs damaged by hail. I remember getting hit by a hailstorm just as we were taking the canoes out of the river at our youth camp several years ago. Um, as camp director, I was um, as calm as I could be, but uh, I was kind of worried. They'd been out on the river for three hours. When they left, it was clear. And as the time came for them to come back, I'm checking the weather radar. There's a huge red blob heading right toward us. And right as we were dragging those canoes out of the water, the hail cut loose. So we were dragging those canoes up the cliff in uh, hail and lightning. But you do not want to be outside during a hailstorm. And uh, I had forgotten about the fact that God gave the warning in this way. Um, but we find a division among the people in how they reacted to God's warning, don't we? Those servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord, they made their servants and livestock come inside. While those who paid no regard for the word of the Lord, they left their servants and their livestock out in the fields. You know, what an amazing division that takes place here. God didn't divide them. They divided themselves based on how they reacted to the word of God. Those who fear the Lord and obey the Lord are the one and the same. And those who don't care about the Lord, they're the ones who disobey the Lord. And I would suggest that division between the saved and the lost, that's still happening today, isn't it? It's not God who's dividing people. He's giving the message uh, how we react to it. That's how um, we're dividing ourselves in, in a sense. So if God says, I'm about to send hail bigger than anybody's ever seen in this nation before, that's a warning that we take seriously. And at this point, I'm kind of uh, kind of was thinking earlier today, um, can you imagine being in Pharaoh's throne room? when this warning is given. And now imagine if you are starting to believe Moses, I mean, we're now pretty well into this and you're, you're the one of these guys who's believing according to this passage. Can you imagine kind of slipping word to somebody? Hey, can you run, go, go tell my family, get everybody inside here. And uh, it's kind of an interesting way that might've gone down. And then the others didn't care and they're the ones who lost everything. So let's see what happens next. And, uh, continue on with the next paragraph. This is Exodus 9, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 26 to see what happens. Exodus 9, 22 through 26. Now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky, that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very severe, such as not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Well, plague number seven has now become a reality. God commands, Moses obeys, using his staff to call down thunder and hail and fire. I'm assuming that's a reference to lightning here. I wouldn't swear my soul on it. That seems to be what it is. And it happens continually. It's just one huge hailstorm, and it, it's to the extent that they'd never seen this before since Egypt had become a nation. And notice this devastation is widespread on the fields, on the people, on the animals, even trees are shattered. Um, however, we have this note at the end that the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were living, is completely untouched by any of this. So there is a line of devastation, complete chaos and terror on one side while everything is absolutely fine on the other side. This is very clearly miraculous. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last passage. This is Exodus chapter 9, verses 27 through 35. Exodus 9, verses 27 through 35. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I go out of the city, 
I will spread my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they ripened late. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Well, up in verse 27, Pharaoh is so close, isn't he? He is right there, right on the verge of making some really good decisions. In fact, he almost seems and sounds like King David for a minute, doesn't he? I'm thinking Psalm uh, 51. Uh, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one. I and my people, we are the wicked ones. Doesn't that sound contrite? That sounds, I mean, that's a good thing to say. It's a good attitude to have. That right there is pretty much a perfect confession of guilt. No defending himself, no excuses, no, I did it, but this is why I did it. But simply, I have sinned. So he's had enough of the thunder and hail. He asked Moses to make supplication to the Lord. He's ready to let the people go. Uh, you shall stay no longer. So that's what he's saying outwardly. Uh, Moses seems to agree to this. He gives another sign. He will leave. He will appeal to the Lord. And the thunder and hail will cease right at that moment. So that's further confirmation. And you kind of get the sense that Moses sees that Pharaoh needs a little more convincing so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. However, let's notice that Moses is not convinced. He's seen this before. Uh, in verses 31 and 32, we find some crops were ruined due to the stage that they were in at the time, but other crops were spared since they ripened later. And I think this is here for a reason, explaining that, that there is still more that could be destroyed. And God didn't do everything. There, there's still some here in reserve. Well, just as Moses predicted, once Pharaoh sees the hail and thunder stop, he changes his mind. And he sinned again. He hardened his heart, he and his servants. So we've had plague after plague after plague, all for nothing at this point. So the water to blood, the, the gnats, the, the flies, the frogs, we're back at square one. Uh, Pharaoh really has not learned anything from this. But like we pointed out last week, almost like church discipline, it may not accomplish one objective, saving the soul of the person who's sinning, but it still might accomplish something else. So in the same way, um, the plagues may not be convincing Pharaoh, but the something else here that is being accomplished, number one, is some Egyptians now have obeyed. And that right there is huge. So there are some Egyptian people, apparently some even in the leadership of the nation, who are starting to see that God is the one true and living God. But there's something else that's going on here, and that is Moses is gaining some credibility in the eyes of the people, preparing him uh, to lead them out of the nation of Egypt and into the wilderness. If you remember, Moses has been gone for 40 years, and he started out not really being one of them. He was kind of the man in the middle, kind of not trusted by his own people, certainly not trusted by the Egyptians, and now God says, you're going to lead him out. And from a leadership point of view, I'm thinking, well, who do you think you are? And this right here is God establishing Moses as a leader of the people, giving him some credibility. By the way, something I was just uh, thinking about, um, with, uh, with Moses leaving, you know, Moses or God could have had the hail stop right there, but I want to, you know, like right there in the throne room, boom, it, it stops. But have you thought about how this would have gone down? Moses says, I'm going to go over there. And then I'm going to call on God to stop the hail. Just kind of paraphrasing here. Can we picture that? Who's going outside right now with ginormous hailstones and lightning coming from the sky? Well, I'm assuming Moses walks right out the door, doesn't he? He leaves in order to cause the hail to stop. But doesn't stop till he gets to where he's going. So in my mind, Moses walks out the door and there is this circle of protection. There is this force field around him. No hail is falling on Moses. Moses isn't in danger of getting killed by hail in this moment. But he goes over there, and I think that's one more confirmation, that Moses is God's spokesman. God is protecting him through this. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 9. And next week, we plan on getting to plagues number 8 and 9. That would be the locusts and the darkness. 
Sorry to spoil it for you, but I think a lot of us have read this before. So get ready for Locust and Darkness. And on Sunday, I believe Aaron is out of town, so Caleb should be leading us through the next few verses of the book of Jude. Uh, I don't think Caleb is learning about it right now for the first time. I'm pretty sure Aaron talked to him. So uh, Caleb should be teaching the adult Bible class at 930. Then we'll plan on continuing in Hebrews chapter 11 with some examples of living by faith. And that'll be in our worship assembly. Again, if you have any questions, comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we need to be praying about, if there's something we can do to encourage you, some need like that, uh, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one true and living God, the great God, the King above all others, ruler of the nations. You raise up kingdoms and bring them down, caring for your people all along the way. Father, we're thankful that you have allowed us to study from your book tonight. We're thankful for your servant Moses and for his courage in obeying you, even though he hesitated at first. We pray that you will bless the Four Lakes congregation. We pray that you would bless those who are recovering from various surgeries and illnesses. We pray for those who are confined at home or in facilities. We pray that you would bless us as we reach out and encourage and help as we can. We pray for those who are struggling with invisible or chronic illnesses and for those who are just barely keeping it together through the stress of everyday life. Bless those who've made it their life's mission to serve and protect and help others. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who came to this earth to seek and to save the lost. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.